Hello there, everybody in UK Campbell. Um, um, sorry about that, Stuart. Um, uh, the countdown took me a bit by surprise there. Um, I hear we still provide to talk about his latest book um, from Ash Henderson. Could you tell us a bit about it, please, Stuart? Um, well, it's uh, it's quite dark. It's family friendly fun in places. Um, almost nobody dies. Um, and everybody has a, has a jolly good time and um, it's it's got a happy ending. <laughs> um, you, yeah. you believe that, don't you? Yeah. Um, being a big, 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 big fan of yours, I started with Logan McRae and I was just curious as to what it was like to switch to Ash Henderson um, as a series. Oh, I really like it. I really, really like it. Um, but it's just, he's so different to write uh, than Logan. You know, Logan is this team player, and he's you know Logan's a good guy uh, in a in a really difficult job. But he's just a normal guy, um, and he, he, he I, I put him in horrific situations um, and give him terrible colleagues to work with. But you know he's he's a regular kind of guy. Uh, Ash is a much more traditional. Um, protagonist for a crime novel. You know, he, he is a lone wolf um, and he's a lot more old school, shall we say. Uh, a man who's... Uh, uh, his morals are somewhat more flexible than Logan's, shall we say. Yeah. And he's yeah. first person as well, which is yeah. which is a lot of... You know, I, I write a very close third person when I'm doing um, Ash, uh, when I'm doing, sorry, when I'm doing Logan um, and, uh, and a lot of other books but with ash because it's all first person uh it's it's a much more immersive experience when i'm writing him yeah i do i do find it different to logan especially with the sidekick of alice with the psychologist that's that's new as well yeah well that again that that's a, that's a slightly more standard trope for detective fiction isn't it that the the detective works closely with a, a forensic profiler and they solve the murders and they interview people and they do all that stuff that real police officers, you know, of that kind of rank would never do because it would be a big team. But um, yeah, yeah, that's sort of one thing I really enjoy is sort of playing with the conventions of the genre. Yeah, your books are um, longer than um, uh, a lot of the books I read as well. Um, is it a big, is it hard to create such big universes? When when your books are longer, or is it easier? Um, I kind of, I, I've been trained to write longer books because my first two contracts from HarperCollins, so that the, the first six books, they all said that they had to be at least 120,000 words. So I have, I have been trained that a book needs to be that kind of length. Um, and also, you know, I, I write using a method um, sort of called close associative discourse which means that you're getting all the sensory information that the characters get rather than you know, a more sort of summary narrative approach. And that just automatically makes for a slightly bigger book. Yeah. You showed us a uh, map of your universe before it came online. Could you, could you just give the audience a quick look? Well, this is the version that appeared in uh, the end papers of A Dark So Deadly. So all done absolutely to scale as a Collins Street Finder map. Uh, I got them to send me through the, the, all the dimensions and the line thicknesses and the colors, and they even sent me the patterns. So, you know, the, there's, a, there's a graveyard here that is, you know, that, that, that's the graveyard pattern that you get in, in Collins Street Finders. Uh, but of course, it's just an extract. The map that I usually use to write uh, is I wanted it to be as realistic as possible. So it's a proper big, big stonk of a job. Well, yeah, nothing. And of course, there, you'll see there are there are blank bits on it, so that I can I can expand into areas that I haven't written about. 
So I've written quite a lot about King's Meath. So there's that part of the city's fairly well um, delineated. Uh, but Sharpstain, I've not done a huge in, amount in. Uh, so that that has room to grow, which is nice. Uh, and Ochterowen and Fiddersmuir and places like that, uh, just to the north of the city. Yeah, it's, it's obsessional and it's a stupid thing to do, but I kind of like it. You, me you mentioned your writing process earlier. Uh, what, what made you go for that? Because it sounds different to panting or planning. I've never heard, even heard of it. Um, well, it's, it's not really, it's not about the structure of the book as such. It's about, um, it, it's, it's, it's more about the narrative being very immersive from the character's point of view. So if, if Ash is somewhere, it's not just a case of, you know, it, it, it's smelly. Well, what does it smell of? And it's not just that. I mean, it's a, you know, if something smells of petrol, what does petrol actually smell like? Yeah. And it's, 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 it's that, that little things, because it also allows you to play with things like synesthesia, which is fun. Because, you know, if, if I describe something as being um, a, a sharp yellow smell, you know, you can picture that if it it could be a lemon, then that's fine. If I if I call it a sharp yellow smell, and I'm talking about a urinal, you get a very yeah. different picture. Even though it's exactly the same words, but they they can do very very different jobs. Um, and I, I I spend a lot of time with that kind of thing, sort of building the uh, the atmosphere of a place and a scene through that kind of sodding about. Well, that, that, it definitely works on audiobook as well, because it's um, with the level of description that you use for that kind of, for that kind of process. It definitely My works. German publisher just is, just, oh, it adds 20, translating from English to German normally adds about 20% in terms of length. And my books are big books to start with. My German translator loves me because he gets paid by the word. <laughs> Um, when you were writing The Dark So Deadly, um, that was tw 21, 21 hours and had a, um, a, a team of what you call um, Mick Heron outsiders. Um, and they're in, and they're in uh, the cover maker's garden. What was it like to bring them back? Uh, it was kind of weird. I, I like the Misfit Mob because unlike... You know, you, 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 some people have said, oh, it's a bit new tricks, but the whole point of new tricks is that it's, you know, that's a TV series built around these these guys who were very, very good at their jobs and are now a specialist elite team, whereas the misfit mob are people that Police Scotland would desperately love to fire and get rid of, but they can't for legal reasons. So they have shunted all the, the people that they see as no-hopers uh, into this one place where they hope they can do the least amount of damage. Uh, and that in itself is, is a lot of fun to write about because, you know, they're not a cohesive team that love each other. Um, the, the people with characters like um, uh, DC Watt gets on everybody's tits. Um, and he still thinks he's like, he is the mutt's testicles. And, mm. and everybody else is just, oh, dear, you're so annoying. And that's fun, because um, obviously you, know, you get a lot of drama for free uh, if characters don't actually like each other, but they still have to work together. Now that you've brought them back, do you think they'll have the series of their own, or are they just going to pop in and out? I don't know. I don't know. There's um, it, it apparently it becomes complicated for things like um, selling the rights. If I if I ever wanted to go and sort of say somebody can have them for TV or a film. Once you start doing that crossover -y thing where characters pop up in, in multiple books, it can be a bit problematical. But I like it. I like them. I like, I like weird characters. But I also like creating weird characters. So there's a lot of fun for me to be had in putting the misfit mob to one side and coming up with another bunch of weirdos to write about. One of the questions I got before was asking about TV adaptations. I mean, is there 
any um, no nope. TV coming up? No. Um, okay. That's, uh, not at all. Why not? not um, TV people fundamentally don't understand how the Logan books work. Okay. Yeah. And I know that sounds sort of awfully, oh, they just don't understand the my juniors. But every, every production company that has been involved, they, they always want Logan to become a weirdo because that's traditionally how crime fiction on television works. You know, you, your Morse, is, Morse is a freak. He is, you know, he's the classical, he has classical music, he has his vintage cars, he has his real ale. Rebus is a weirdo um, with the heavy drinking and the rock music and um, you know Sherlock Holmes is an absolute you wouldn't want to be in the same room with the man with his obsessional logic and his opium and his violin playing and that, that's that's the traditional hero of, of crime um, especially on television so whenever production companies get involved they always think well Logan has to be weird because otherwise he's not, he can't carry a TV drama. He has to have weird character tricks and traits, and he's not designed like that. He is meant to work for weirdos, which is why D.I. Steele is the way she is, um, and D.I. Inch was the way he was, and Finney was the way he is. And it's it's that inversion of, well, you know how, you know, Sherlock Holmes has Watson. <clears throat> so Watson is, is as a, the sidekick he represents as the reader because Sherlock Holmes has to explain things to Watson and that's Conan Doyle explaining things to us the reader <coughs> and I thought it would be fun to turn it on its head so Logan is the sidekick and he always works for people who should be the hero of the novels D.I. Steele should be the hero of the novel uh, and Logan the normal person is the sidekick uh, and it just that they just cannot get that. They can't sort of comprehend that for for TV. The he, the the main character has to be the weirdo, so they they give him these bizarre character traits that he's not meant to have, and then they tone down Steel, so that she she's not because he has to be weirder than she is, and it's just the dynamic just doesn't work anymore because that's that's not how this that's not how these books work. It just isn't how they work. Stop messing about with them. Yeah. Comedy is one of the main um, plants of why I like your books so much. What, what do you like about the dark humour of your books? Oh, thank you much. I'm very glad you do. But that's just, uh, uh, just you know, when I started writing, I thought, wouldn't it be nice to portray police officers as if they were real people? Because, you know, normally... Well, certainly when I started, um, often police officers were, they were basically robots for justice and they didn't really have much in the way of private lives and they were just obsessed with finding the killer and everything was all very grim faced. And of course, police officers in real life just aren't like that at all. Um, I spent a lot of time hanging out with police, uh, particularly when I was writing uh, The Missing and the Dead, when Logan goes back into uniform. And I spent time with the guy who does Logan's job in real life. So um, uh, Sergeant Bruce Crawford, who was the, the duty sergeant for B Division. And that's that's the job that I gave Logan. Uh, and I, 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 you know, I, I hung out with them. I did, it, I did shifts with them early shifts, late shifts, back shifts. Um, we dunted indoors. We, you know, we, we, we stopped a guy for speeding. Um, we, you know, we, we, we span druggies. As it's called, and it was, and, and they, they are not in any way, shape, or form this this poor faced bunch of people. They have to have a professional face on when they, they deal with members of the public, but as soon as they're with each other, the amount of taking the piss out of each other is just phenomenal. They're really funny, funny kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, what, 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 from, from your research doing that, what um, what have you um, taken as the have you taken plot lines from those from those research trips? I am. Um, I to be honest, the stuff, the weirdest little bits in those books 
are stuff that's based on real life. I mean, you know, if you if you've read um, the Missing and the Dead, there's a scene where there's an old lady who is convinced that there are rats in her bed, and her bed is just absolutely chock a block full of rats. And that whole that little story and what happens there is exactly what happened in real life. And even even little there's a, there's a more or less a throwaway comment um, about somebody having to go up to do a, a, I don't know if it's a car crash or it was a helicopter crash or whatever, and they have to go up to Shetland to do it. And the accountants have given them a rocket because there's all these, they're seeing all these, um, all these, in, all these invoices and expenses coming in for flights. And did nobody think to take a train to Shetland, <laughs> which is like yeah. all the sea between, you know, it's just, it, it's, it's really bizarre, stupid little things like that. And a, a huge number of those things in that book are, are completely true. Um, when um, you write the short stories um, collections, um, how how is it to, is it any easier to um, use your um, characters or would you like um, create new ones for short stories? Um, it's all six of one. It really depends. There are some short stories that are written with Logan, or more more often with Steel uh, and Tufty. For example, there's uh, I, during lockdown, I wrote two short novels and two novellas, um, and they are the, one is almost exclusively Steel. One is Steel and Tufty. Uh, another is Steel and Tufty, and one is just a complete new bunch of people as well. So it, it really all depends. Um, I have a, a whiteboard with lots of little bits on it that uh, I sort of steal bits off every now and again, just to see, you know, what, what can work and what might not. So I honestly don't know. I honestly don't. Know. Sometimes it's um, just a title that that, and then I've got to figure out what the hell does that mean uh, and how to work with it. But you know, there's. There's, I just don't know. Yeah. That was a real, that was quite a ramble, wasn't it? I just <laughs> disappeared off in a great big sack of fish there. <laughs> Made perfect sense, even though it was a what you described as a sack of fish. I love those, I, I love those phrases that you would probably use in a book as well. Um, where did you come up with those sack of fish ideas? What's your best small phrase? Um, you know, the, don't tell anybody, okay? This is this is this is just between the two of us. It's a secret. An awful lot of the time, I just do those kind of things to make my wife laugh when she reads the book. Fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. I love I love those little phrases because it it just just um, especially when you read it on audio and you're not expecting it, and you just burst out laughing completely randomly. Well, one of my, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, who's your inspiration when you write? Uh, and I would say, I would actually say that the, the, the person that has had the biggest influence on my writing is Victoria Wood. Yeah, I, I loved her in the, um, oh God, the, when she wrote the one about the diaries of World War II, um, that, uh, I think it was uh, in 46 or something. Yeah, very, very comedic dark one she wrote about. No, I've not, I've, I've not tried that one. Yeah. But, I mean, Dinner Ladies, for me, is one of the most perfect pieces of television ever. Oh, definitely is, yeah. Uh, so so you, you will generally find at least one Dinner Ladies reference in every single book. Oh, I'll have to go fishing and have a look now. Yeah. I'm going to enjoy um, trying to find the references now. I'm a big fan. Yeah. Um, what um, would you say is um, the motivation for your titles? Because uh, the Cotton Maker's Garden is a is a strange title, really. Um, I mean, it's explained well by the plot, but um, it's not a typical title. 
No, well, um, we've always had a, a bit of a, I'm trying to think how, how, how best and most politely to put this. Um, I have I have chosen very few of the titles of my books over the years. Um, very, very few of the titles that um, I actually thought up before I started writing have made it through to the, the actual bookshelf. Um, so uh, it's a really quite depressed to realize at one point that you can go all the way back, you know, almost to the very start of my series, just using the words dark, dead, deadly, blood, cold. Oh, and bones. Bones as well, yeah. It's just, uh... So for this, I wanted something a bit more... I wanted something more lyrical, and I was able to persuade um, sales and marketing and editorial to let me have this title. Yeah, it's, it really describes the uh, killer in it rather well, I think, yeah. Well, it, it, it sort of, it, it sort of got that, you know, garden has that, that spades and earth and digging and things growing underground and, you know, and, and Coffin Maker, that's a, that's, a, that's a nice sort of cheery name, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, very evoking. Um, when, I, when I was um, looking at the theme of the book, because you did do... You've um, written books with a lot of themes. What was it about coastal erosion that uh, attracted you to write this plot? Um, I remember seeing a documentary on Channel 4 ages ago about coastal erosion and, um, and villages falling into the sea. But as I was starting to think what the next book was going to be about, a uh, new scientist was, they, they kept emailing sort of, these are our upcoming stories. And there would be this picture of um, a, a house right on the edge of the cliff. And they were talking about climate change and, um, and coastal erosion. And I just saw that image and I thought, that would be such a great place to kick off a crime novel. Because you, you, you immediately get the thing of, you know, if you have been spent, if you have spent the last 16 years filling your garden with your victims, like like we know serial killers can do um and, and remarkably get away with this kind of stuff for years and years and years and move house three or four times and then the police will have to go back in time to find out where you lived in 1972 dig up the garden and discover six or seven bodies and i thought wouldn't that be really interesting if it was right on the coast and the coastline was coming away and it's not safe for the police to go in and dig up the bodies. And they know that they're there. They just, but they have no idea how many are there or what's happened or where the person who's buried them has gone. And I thought, oh, that would be fun. That would be a, a good, fun place to start a crime novel. So it, it all, it all genuinely, the entire thing came from that one photograph that new scientists kept sending me every day for about a week. I, I love, um how how dark um some of your themes are um and in um early, i'm reading Rankin at the moment and he's got a uh, cafeteria and stuff um it's like um have you ever got a, an idea for a dark villain that would run run through a series or have you had one like, is one that you'd like to talk, think about uh, well, yeah, um, Mrs. Kerrigan in the first Ash novel yes, yes. is she is just utterly, utterly vile. She is so horrible, such and such a really, really terrible villain. Um, and the guy that she works for is really nice. So she, you know, yeah. she, she is his enforcer. She is horrible, so that he doesn't have to be. And he's he's all affable and, and how are you and it was lovely seeing you all oh, oh, ash my old matey matey mate. Um, meanwhile, she is she's having people beaten up and their thumbs broken and gouging people's eyes out and having them shot. Uh, and she was a love she was a great villain. Um, but I never thought I would write 
a second ash book. And having written a, a second ash book, I thought there's no way in hell I'll ever write a third one. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I like, I like a villain who isn't just a black hat and twirly moustache. Yeah. Um, when we, I've, I've done uh, writing workshops up at Moniac Moor, and one of the things we talk about is developing an antagonist. And we, we go through all that. And we were doing this live and I was asking, you know, so what does this person love? And I think if you can answer that about your 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 antagonist, that goes a whole lot, a whole way to, uh, to, to make them more human and also make them make them more scary as well. You know, because it, it becomes it's, it's very easy for an antagonist to be a monster. Um, who isn't like you and me, but once they are like us, then I think that becomes a lot more powerful. Yeah, Birthdays for the Dead is quite a, um, a dark start to a series. I can't, I can't say I've ever heard of a protagonist that I feel sorry for as much as do Ash. Well, you see, the Birthdays for the Dead, that was my, I, I thought it would be fun as an experiment to write a Shakespearean tragedy. So that is, I mean, Ash Henderson is a powerful man who is brought low by his own actions. So the whole structure of that book and the way that everything happens in it is all designed around that notion. Um, that it, it is this, this Shakespearean tragedy. It's your King Lear style, just utter disaster that gets worse and worse because of what he does. You know, the, he, a, a bit of awful luck happens to him before the book starts that he, he's not responsible for. But after that, almost every single terrible thing that happens to him is because of something he has done to somebody else. Uh, and that was that was really quite a lot of fun. I've never tortured anybody as much as I have tortured Ash Henderson. But I think it's because he's not a white hat that it allows it to... You, you feel more open that you, if dark things do happen to him, he's put himself in that position. Um, well, yeah, he, he's a, he is a man of violence. Um, yeah. and, and that's another thing that really separates him from Logan. Is, and that's what I wanted to do. And that's why I gave him arthritis as well. Um, so that he cannot, it's very difficult for him to actually commit violence. But his, his first reaction in any scenario would be to knock somebody's block off. He just can't do it. Um, and that's that's fun as well. I'm a horrible person. I torture him something foul. Well, I think it's about time an author did. I was talking about cross-pollination. Do you think you'd put Ash and Logan together in a book? I can't. They, they don't exist in the same universe because Old Castle's not real. So yeah. as far as Logan's concerned, you can't go there because Logan lives in the real Aberdeen. Um, so Ash can come to Aberdeen, but he doesn't exist in the same universe as Logan. They really wouldn't get on as well. With, with, um, with you writing Logan in, in Aberdeen, does the, does the real world versus the fictional world provide you with any extra challenges? Um, it does when the city changes, as it has a habit of doing. Uh, and I have written, you know, that you go down this street and this happened. And six months later, when the book comes out, I discover that actually that building has just been torn down. And things have changed and moved. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it's the city keeps moving the goalposts um, when it comes to that kind of thing. So I just have to be a little bit, a little bit, you know, well, it might change, but it's my Aberdeen. So I can do what I like and poo to anybody who says differently. So when you were starting the Logan series, why was it Aberdeen for you that was the city you chose? Um, I'm going to blame Ian Rankin. Uh, he came up to do an event at the Waterstones. Uh, no, it would have been Autocars in those days. I, and um, I was doing book reviews for a website at that point. And he very kindly met up with us in a pub before his event and bought him a pint 
and um, chatting a, a wee as you do. And uh, I was I was considering having a bash at crime fiction. Uh, well, I've been writing crime fiction anyway, but actually trying to do something that was actually publishable. Um, and we were talking about settings, and he said, "Well, why not write it about Aberdeen?" Because um, well, in those days, the only crime fiction that got written about was either in teeny wee Highland villages. Glasgow or Edinburgh, and that was it. The rest of Scotland didn't exist. Um, so I'm blaming him. Well, if you can blame anybody, I think Ian's a good person to blame, I think. Yeah. He has broad shoulders for that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, when um, you um, first published, um, it, this uh, anniversary for you were telling us before that it's anniversary today. It is, yes. It's my pub anniversary, or book anniversary, which is slightly easier to say. Uh, 16 years to the day that Cold Granite was published. So 16 years for me. Yay. Um, and, uh, and like the Queen, uh, it's it, I have two book anniversaries. Uh, this is the actual date. And the first Thursday following, which is always publication day in the UK, um, is the official book anniversary. So um, I should really be having something nice for tea tonight. What what is it you like to cook for yourself? Because I know you've got a reputation as a cook as well. Well, I have. Uh, I, I do have my World Stovies Championship. Um, my award is the, it's the only award that I actually keep out. I would, I would, I would struggle to lay hands on, for example, he he said, sounding frightfully modest, of my uh, celebrity mastermind, for example. Not entirely certain where that's gone, but it'll, it'll be gathering dust somewhere. But this, this, this is my world Stovies champion. Ooh, look, it's engraved and everything. So, and it has, as you can see. Cat whiskers. Yeah. I collect cat whiskers. We have four cats. Why don't we, we wait till they fall out naturally? You know, I'm, I'm not off with a pair of tweezers. That would just be wrong, wrong and bad. But yeah, so that, that, the, the, only, the only award of which, of which I, I actually have on display in my study. Um, thinking of cats, um... There aren't, there aren't, um, are there any books in the series with um, cats in them? Because Ellie Griffiths has cats in all of her books. Uh, well, Logan has a cat, Cthulhu. Um, yeah. And to be honest, the only reason that Logan has Cthulhu is because I wanted to write, I wanted to put my cat, Grendel, in the book. Nice. Um... The only reason he has a cat, so I could write about a cat. Because and of course um, Ash, because he has to be different from Logan. Ash has a dog, and I don't have a dog. Um, when when um, writing, um, uh, Ellie does it in a shed, and uh, cat Gus is often there in the same room. Are your cats with you when you write? Um, not as much as they used to be. Um, Grendel's quite a an elderly lady now, um, but certainly for most of my books, um, in the old house, I, there was quite a draft that used to come in through the window under my table, under the, the, under the desk that I worked at. Uh, so I would always write in a big dressing gown to stop my legs from freezing off under the table. And Grendel used to come and climb into the, the folded pouch. That was the cuddle pouch, and she used to come in there and she would purr and purr and purr and get her head rubbed and little kisses off the top of her head and then she would fall asleep against daddy's chest and I would write about bloody murder and dismemberment and horror with this lovely warm kitten just just snoozing away against me. Um, is, is I'm a soft bastard aren't I? <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with having soft elements to everybody I mean uh, if, if that's what makes me a good villain. Yeah. If all your villains didn't have soft elements to them as well, then they wouldn't be fully rounded. Um, yeah. Um, who would you say that your that your favourite non like 
character, the, the villain that you've read from some, what somebody else has written? Ooh, actually, I, I would say, and I can't remember what the character's name is. I shall have to look it up. Um, but have you seen Princess Mononoke? No, no I haven't. No. Um, okay. Um, I can thoroughly recommend it. Really, really can recommend yeah. it. Absolutely stonking film. Um, and the antagonist in that does some horrific things, but for really, really good reasons. Yeah. Uh, we, we expect her, when we meet her, to be this absolute horror. Um, Lady Eboshi, and she's she's destroying the forest. She's completely upset the scales of nature, and unleashed horror and darkness upon the world, and wants to kill the forest god. You know, she was she was absolutely horrific character, but um, because of that, she's 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 only doing it to protect her people. You know, she she has she has. She has this sort of fortress where where all her people live, and she takes care of the lepers within it uh, personally, and everything is done for the benefit of her people, who she really loves, and she is such a great villain because of that. Um, and I don't I don't think I've ever seen it done as well as it's done in that film, but visually stunning as well. So I. Thoroughly recommend Princess Mononoke. I'm definitely going to have to look that up. Yeah, I do love a good dark film. Um, one of the things I've noticed on the audio book is when is when you put radio um, excerpts in the books because they're very comedic. Um, what made you come up with that idea to break the novel up? Uh, well. <laughs> Again, it's, it's part of that whole close associative discourse thing. Um, it, it, I could very easily just write a scene where two officers are in a car and all they do is talk to each other. But if the radio is playing, then I like it not always to be about the plot. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, and, and there are some, some books and TV shows when whenever the character turns on the telly, it's just in time to catch the news um, that's, 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 that's talking about the thing that they're interested in. Um, and, and sometimes I just like to have you know, commercials and stuff. But it's all that. It's, it's about being in the car with the characters. They're having to parse what they're saying to their colleagues with what they're seeing, what they're feeling, and the stuff on the radio as well. Um, and I like that, that layering. Um, and sometimes it also means that I can sneak in things that are important to the plot but you don't know which one of the things it is yeah i must admit that does make me laugh i just i just feel sometimes a little bit sorry for the narrator especially especially when you ask them to sing oh i i have i have done some horrible things to the narrators and just you know completely on purpose as well i will sometimes i have I have genuinely, on several occasions, sat down and just constructed a sentence that, if you're reading it in your head, is fine. But if you actually have to read it out loud, is an appalling tongue twister. <laughs> um, and I just, <laughs> this is this is this is this is true. This is true. Um, back in the back in the day, the uh, Harper Collins never hired actors from the northeast of Scotland. So they couldn't really do the accent properly. And I, I very seldom listen to the audiobooks because it just drives me insane. But they weren't even pronouncing the place names properly. You know, I mean, we, we have a, a place up here um, called Giri, which is actually spelt Garioch. But every time this was mentioned in the narration, it would be Garioch. And everything was done in a very angry voice regardless of what was actually being discussed. Would you like a cup of tea, Logan? Asked D.I. Steele. Yes, I would, replied Logan. Do you have any biscuits? <laughs> and I was like, 
no. Well, apart from anything else, I, I wouldn't write that like that because you know um, I, I don't actually use dialogue tags. But still, you know. But it was, and I thought, right. Well, if you have difficulty pronouncing places like Giri and Tara and all these other things, um, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a book that has Polish people in it because there was a big thing. Um, in Aberdeen, the, the press were trying to whip up about how Polish Polish people coming over here, and you can't you can't shop in their shops. They won't take your money because you're not Polish, and oh, it's all of these, and they've taken over this pub, and you can't have oh no because you have to be Polish to be served in that pub. As if anybody is going to come from all the way from, down from Poland up to the northeast of Scotland in order to try and make money and make a better life for themselves and their family, and then go. I don't want your money. Go away. Don't spend your money with me. I would hate for that to happen. Why would I want to pay my bills and my mortgage? No, no, get out of my shop. You know, that's some nonsense. So I thought, right, I've got a plot that would work very well with that. So we will have Polish people in it. So they will have Polish names that you're going to have to pronounce, Mr. Narrator. And I thought, oh, be even better, even better. How about Logan goes to Poland at one point in the story. I could make it. I could make it so he has to go to Poland. Yeah, let's Logan go to Poland. That means you don't just have Polish names. You've got Polish place names that you're going to have to pronounce. <laughs> oh, and because I do the close associative discourse thing, people in Poland will shock and indeed horror speak Polish. <laughs> and Logan doesn't speak Polish, so you don't get the translation. You get what he gets. If somebody speaks at him in Polish, it's the Polish that goes down on the page. Um, I got some very lovely guys um, who came from Krakow, which is you know where Logan goes to, and they helped me translate it into the local idiom as well. And this all went in the book. And I thought, right, sod you, you you just have so much fun when you narrate this one. Ha ha ha! Uh, what I didn't know was that it had become a bit expensive. To hire actors, uh, and they, they they said, "Stuart, you've done a bit of panto and stuff like that, haven't you?" Yeah. Uh -huh. You fancy reading your, your the audiobook for the new one? Yeah, you know, yeah, no, that'll be cool. I can go. Oh, sodding hell! <laughs> so I had to go away and learn how, <laughs> learn how to pronounce all this stuff. Um, and I go, "Oh, what a twit!" <laughs> and having having made my own life difficult, I've decided that it is now okay for me to make every single narrator's life difficult from that point onwards. Uh, it's only fair. Absolutely. Uh, one of the uh, most favourite titles, titles of mine of these short stories is Stramash. Could you explain what that is, please? Oh, Stramash. Um, I was really, really lucky to be um, invited to be a sort of, sort of a writer in residence for Jeweller Distillery for a week. And uh, five or six days, my wife and I, we went across and we stayed in this lodge that the distillery own and keep on. And it's beautiful. It's a really lovely, lovely, lovely place. Um, and, you know, the island's wonderful. And there was, they had laid on so much whiskey. It was great. There was like, I think there was four or five different types of Jura, Isle of Jura whiskey, uh, just on, on this occasional table in one of the rooms. You know, it's a, this lovely, lovely, lovely building and all the whiskey that you could drink. And it was just the best week ever. Um, and the, the deal was that in return, I would write a short story that they could use. And uh, I did a sort of a, a, a cocaine version of Whiskey Galore. So it, it's basically cocaine galore set on Jura. Um, and I, again, a lot of the... the I think pretty much everywhere that's mentioned in that book exists. Even down to the place that Logan and Steele go for a cup of tea and a bit of cake. And that's exactly how you have tea and cake when you go to that bit of Jura on the beach. Uh, we've got 15 minutes left, so I'm going to just pop to all these questions. They're going to give us a sec, because uh, my assistant will probably... A chance to read them out unless you can find them yourself. I don't know if you can see them. Um, I don't know. I mean, what have we got here? I think it was Housewife 49. What? 
that's the uh, Victoria Wood thing, yeah. Okay, okay. No, that makes more sense now. I thought, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, do you have do you have any? Oh, Roberta Steele reminds me of Anne Robinson. Oh. I don't know if I don't think. <laughs> Still, would be hugely impressed by that comparison. I think she would much rather, you know, she reminded you of Anne Hathaway <laughs> or Kira Knightley. Kira Knightley, definitely, she would be very happy with Kira Knightley. Yeah, I'm not, it's quite, quite an interesting image that is, isn't it? Yeah. In setting the scene, how do you know enough is enough with description? That's a good question. That's a good question. There, it's there's. There is no hard and fast rule to it. It's just, it's easy to get carried away. It's just, just sort of knowing when to just back off the pedal slightly. And uh, you, know, you, could, you could describe absolutely everything. Or you could go to the other extreme, the sort of the, there's Elmore Leonard, who would have almost no description of whatsoever. Um, horses for courses. I have no idea. I don't. I, I'm just making this stuff up as I go along, to be honest. Um, yeah. Oh, we've answered that one. Um, what was the inspiration for the Coffee Maker's Garden? What made me want to be an author? Um, peer pressure. Well, that's that, that, that's genuine. That's not a flippant. Ha ha answer. It's, it's genuinely true. I had a couple of friends at the time who were writing fantasy novels um, and they said that this was fun and I should give it a go and so I thought well yeah why not I've been a huge reader all my life I'll have a bash and um, so in my mid-twenties I sat down and instead of you know being sensible and starting with short fiction or even a novella I did a full length comedy crime novel um, and I loved it I just absolutely loved it there's I think writing is probably the only the only activity in life where you have complete control of absolutely everything while you're writing once you've stopped and you've sent it into your agent or your publisher then everything changes and you are no longer in sole control uh, and there's lots of other people's opinions that, that come in. But while you're writing, you are God. And that's just such a wonderful feeling. Because, you know, a lot of people think, we're, you know, that we're playing detective when we write crime fiction. But we're not. We are playing God. We decide who lives, who dies, what happens, where things happen. It's, it's, it's quite intoxicating when it works. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I wrote that first book. I really loved the feeling of doing it. It's a terrible book. It will never, ever see the light of day. Uh, and then I wrote another one. And I got an agent. And I wrote another one after that. And I got rid of my first agent and got a different agent. And, yeah. And then by the time I, I had written my fifth book, I had finally written something good enough to be published. Because uh, that was called Granite. Um. So with it being your fifth book before you before you um, got published, what, what was it like um, trying to get an agent? Because that's what I'm trying to do at the moment. I'm just curious. Um, I I am glad that it took me five books to be honest. And there's this, there's, there's so much pressure on people, particularly when they're starting out. You know, you, it, it's all, all always perceived that. You know, it's, it's your first book that gets published. And it's not usually your first book. It's usually somebody's third, fourth, fifth, sixth book. It's very, very unusual for the first thing somebody has sat down to write to actually be publishable. Uh, and usually that's only because it's somebody who has done a lot of writing in a related field. I mean, for example, um, you know, Mark Billingham, it, that the, the first Thorn book is the first full-size novel that he wrote. But he had been writing scripts for, t for television for years and years and years before that. So, you know, it, it's, you wouldn't pick up a cello and expect to launch straight into Brahms on your first day. You would expect there to be 
practice. You would have to practice to get there. And writing is exactly the same. It took me five novels to get good enough at what I was doing that, that somebody thought, yep, we can publish this and we can sell the rights around the world and we can do it and Stuart can have a career and he doesn't have to work in IT anymore. But, you know, it, it took me five, five books to get to that point. Uh, and I'm glad it did because I would hate to have, you know, if, if I had stuck my first book out, if I had self-published it on Kindle or whatever, it would still be out there. Uh, and I could never get away from that. And, and sometimes it's nice to do your, it's nice to do your practicing where no one can see it. And also it's okay. It's okay to practice. It's okay to write books that aren't very good when you start because it's by writing that we learn how to be better at writing and by reading. But until you actually start putting down the words, um, the, it, they will never get better. Well, when you first started with Cold Granite, did, did you know it was going to be a series with Logan, or is it? Is that? A... No, nope, didn't know anything about it at all. Um, my agent had said, I, I, I had recently handed in um, uh, a sort of a, it's a crime novel, but there were really massive supernatural elements to it. And my agent said, well, for God's sake, can you just stop writing all this woo-woo nonsense and just try a straight crime novel? And so I went away and I wrote Cold Granite. So I had no idea. I never expected it to do very well. Um, I thought if I could, my, my laser printer had just died. I thought if I can make enough money out of it to buy a new laser printer, that would be a result. That would be good. Um, I certainly didn't think I would still be sitting here 16 years later making up lies about people who don't exist. Um, now that you've made up an entire universe that has to be and you were describing places you'd not used yet on the large map, is there, is there anywhere that you're working on at the minute where there's going to be a new part of the universe for them? Oh. Um, we do go out past Dr. Owen in the new book, but we don't actually, we, we just drive through it very briefly. So there's, 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 there's not a lot of detail there. Nothing actually happens in Octoraun, just that we need to be north of it. Uh, so no, not, not from that, from that point of view. Uh, but yeah, I've got, I've, I, I just handed in the first draft of the new book on Saturday morning, having, <clears throat> Sort of, may have been an all-nighter pulled just in order to make sure that I did actually make my deadline. And a considerable quantity of, uh, of Tesco's own brand Red Bull substitute, which is disgusting stuff. <laughs> um, but I, I but I made my deadline. I did make my deadline. I promised, and I did it. So, so yeah. Um, and I have I have no idea if that book is any good or not. And I never know. I never know if it's any good until somebody has read it. Um, it's, you know, books are weird things. They only really exist when somebody reads them. Yeah. Um, it, like quantum physics. Yeah. Like um, Schrodinger's cat kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the, the really weird thing about it is that, you know, I, I'm not a big fan personally of Dan Brown, but he has done incredibly well because there are people who love his books. You know, I could not get on at all with the Da Vinci Code, but other people absolutely adore it. And it's the same words. It's the same book. It's the same words. To me, so there is no such thing as a good book or a bad book. There is just a book you like and a book you don't like. <laughs> So for big, uh, for big Stuart fans, could you tell us when the next book is out, please? Uh, well, it's not going to be out till next year. Not going to be out till next year. Um, I don't have a publication date yet. As I say, I've only just handed it in. It's possible my, my new editor will come back and say, what is this rubbish? Take this away and do it again, but better this time. I don't know. I don't know. I just, no, no idea. Yeah. Can you just... You just moved publisher, aren't you? You're saying? 
Uh, well, yes, um, I'm. I'm off to. I'm off to see the trans world, the wonderful trans world of Oz. So, what was it like moving pub this year? And did that cause you any problems? It was really weird, really, really weird. Um, but my editor, Sarah Johnson, Sarah Hodgson of um, of HarperCollins, uh, she she had she left to go to Corvus. Um, they'd offered her, uh, you know. A, the chance to head up a, a new team of her own um, and it was, it was just far too good an opportunity for her to miss um, and at that point I thought well if Sarah's gone and you know lots of other people that I started with had left HarperCollins and moved on to different jobs maybe it was you know if, if Sarah was going to be brave enough to take this leap and and uh, and try something new and branch out Maybe so should I. So, yeah, we give it a go. So, interesting to see. Interesting to see how it works. I hope it works. Oh God, I hope it works. I think, I think you said the new book was planned to be a standalone. Yeah. Um, well, certainly it does. It does stand alone. Um, it is set in Old Castle, but there aren't really any recurring characters. From it's, 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 it is the same universe. Yeah. And so Ash Ash would exist in this world. It's just he's not involved in the story. Um, I, I, I do love the Doris so Dudley and how long that was. What was it like writing that book? That one was an epic. Um, well, uh, it's kind of, well, A Dark So Deadly is really, it's, it's about a lot of different things, but it's, it's also, at its core, it's a book that is about books. And about reading. Have you ever, ever noticed that when a protagonist reads books, um, that it's it's always it's always sort of philosophy books. You know, it's all, it's all this high flute and stuff. They'll have a maybe a, a slim volume of poetry in their desk drawer. You know, or, 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 you know hits. I, I I read Proust in between cases. You know, and it's all that kind of stuff. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be lovely? To have, to have a protagonist that just loved books, and it's a lot of it's about the books that we love as kids and that we take with us through our lives. Um, so that's a very strong theme that goes through the entire book as well, because uh, we all we all have them, don't we? I mean, there are we all have books that, if we are readers, that that just turned us on to reading. And made us realise that it's such a great thing to do is read a book. Um, for me, it's Winnie the Pooh. It's the yeah. first book that I can remember actually sitting down to read. And I loved it, loved the book. And it's the book that made me a reader for my wife. Um, it was the, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. What's yours? It's got to be um, um, uh, The Hand of the Basket or is it? I think, yeah, that's the first audio book that I really picked up one. Yeah, love, love reading, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, but it's, and, and that's, that's sort of a really key part of A Dark So Deadly, is that notion that the, the books that we read stay with us and become part of our own, you know, our own meta-narrative. Because there, there is, you know, there's, there's a lot of metafiction in that book as well, which was so much fun to do. Yeah. Thank you so much for a great hour, and uh, um, I uh, really enjoyed it. And I'll say to everyone that's uh, watching, uh, please please tune in for our final panel, uh, Four Authors in Search of a Plot. Seven, I believe. Thank you. Good luck with them, because they're very badly behaved. Thank you so much. I think, I think we're offline now. Yes. We are fine, always fine. Then it's a request failed. Mm. So I don't know whether we're offline or whether we're on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is this is the uh, thing about doing online events. This weird sort of shuffly towards the exit business when everybody reaches for the bit that says exit meeting, and everybody's yeah. gone bye bye. <laughs> yeah. Click on the damn thing. It's not working. Why am I still here? Yeah. You're still on, apparently. Samantha has just said she can hear us talking utter rubbish. 
as we speak. <laughs> Right, well, ta-ta, people. It's been lovely. <laughs>